Very interesting one. He is the professor of evolutionary psychology and is currently teaching at Concordia University. He is the author of many books, including The Consuming Instinct, What Juicy Burgers, Ferraris, Pornography, and Gift Giving Reveal About Human Nature, and his upcoming book, The Parasitic Mind, How Infectious Ideas Are Killing Common Sense. He's also a social media personality with appearances on the Joe Rogan show and Dave Rubin show as well. And he talks a lot about the state of academia, public discourse, and freedom of speech. Our guest today is the Gatfather himself. Gat said, welcome to the show. Uh, so nice to be with you, Felix. Thanks for inviting me. Um, before we start, uh, some of the audience already knows you. That's why we don't have any trigger warnings. Uh, but can you, uh, can you introduce yourself? What, what are you doing? What does Gatsad do? So um, I guess I have several hats. Uh, my hat as a professor is uh, I'm someone who studies human nature in general. But what I, the way I do it is I apply evolutionary thinking to understand human behavior in general and consumer behavior in particular. So, for example, how, does, how do our hormones affect our behaviors as consumers? How does uh, culture, even culture is within evolutionary theory. So what I basically do is usually psych consumer psychologists assume that human beings are somehow above their biology, right? Biology applies to the mosquito, biology applies to your dog, to the zebra, but somehow human beings are outside the purview of biology. And I argue that of course that's wrong. And so I try to marry psychology, biology and consumer behavior into one nice mix. All right, so evolution psychology is, is you know, assumes that we as humans are, you know, also influenced by what we inherit, you know, by our genes, by our evolutionary pressures in that way. Um, this is in to certain degree in stark contrast to what most people think, like the social constructivist ones. Um, can you can you outline why so uh, why um, evolutionary psychology is so non politically correct, non PC uh, field of research? Yeah. Okay. Well, how, how many hours do you have? There's there's a whole big discussion here. Let me try to. We have two hours in total. <laughs> All right, great. Uh, so there are a whole bunch of folks who despise evolutionary psychology for different reasons. But what they all share in common is that they feel that evolutionary psychology attacks their pet ideology. So let's start with the one that you use, which is social constructivism. Social constructivism is the incorrect idea that humans are born into the world tabula rasa, empty minds, and it's only the forces of socialization, your parents, your peers, advertising, your rabbi, uh, the Hollywood movies, all of these, these things are what make you who you are. Now, evolutionary psychologists don't reject the idea that socialization matters. Of course, socialization matters, but socialization happens in its forms because of biology. So it's not biology or socialization. Socialization is due to biology. And so, Social constructivists hate it because of tabula rasa. Radical feminists hate evolutionary psychology because they'd like to presume that all sex differences are socially constructed, which of course is, is nonsense. The average two-year-old knows this to be false. Uh, Postmodernists hate evolutionary psychology because evolutionary psychology does presume that there are human universals, whereas postmodernism says there are no universals. Everything is subjective, everything is relative. Uh, cultural relativists hate evolutionary psychology because they don't buy the idea that there might be some moral universals. So there are a whole bunch of different folks who are triggered by evolutionary psychology, not at all because of science, but because it attacks their ideology. So it's a bit of a difficult uh, endeavor to be an evolutionary psychologist because not only do you have to fight as a scientist to get your papers into the top journals and so on, but you also have to fight this dogged resistance. How do you, how do you see that resistance? Is it, has it gotten worse in the last decade or how has it developed? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think it certainly has, in, I mean, the, the resistance had, has gotten weaker, uh, but you know, a, a, an animal is most dangerous when it's wounded because now it's going to put up a fight. So a lot of these uh, folks who hate evolutionary psychology are losing the battle. And the, the reason I say they're losing the battle is because science is a beautiful process. It's autocorrective, right? If, if, if evolutionary psychology were false, then there would be evidence that would come up to dismantle evolutionary psychology. And the reality is that when I look at my career, you know, when I started 25, 26 years ago to now, there are fewer 
angry voices that come after me. I suspect that in 25, 50, 100 years, no one will talk about evolutionary psychology because all of psychology is evolutionary psychology. You can't study something as important as the human mind while rejecting the idea that the human mind has come through a process of evolution, right? There are different groups. So for example, there are some evolutionary biologists who are perfectly willing to accept that evolution explains the behavior of every single other species on earth except humans. Now there are others who say, no, 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 evolution also works for humans, but it stops at the neck. So it explains the opposable thumbs. It explains why your pancreas are the way they are. It explains why the kidney is the way that it is. But don't you dare apply evolutionary thinking to explain the most important organ in your, in your body, which is your, your, your mind. And so they're still putting up resistance, but I suspect that eventually it'll become normal science to accept that the human mind doesn't come from mysterious forces. It's due to evolution. You are uh, you're currently in the process of writing a book in this uh, coming out in October, I, I believe. Uh, the right. well, I think it's written already. It'll be out. It's written already. All right. Yeah. In the last in the last phase of, of going over it, uh, the parasitic mind. Um, you're talking about ideas that actually endanger our Western values. And you also locate the origin of those ideas in academia. What are those ideas and um, what what can we what can we make of it? What is right. the what's the danger of it? So maybe what I'll do is I'll start by explaining how I got the idea of using the parasitic analogy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so evolutionary psychologists, one of the things that we do is that when we're trying to understand human cognition, we use what's called comparative psychology. So you could look to other animals that share a common ancestry with us to see if we share certain commonalities. Those are called homologous traits. So for example, the sex-specific toy preferences that human infants exhibit are also expressed in vervet monkeys and rhesus monkeys and chimpanzees, right? And so I'm, if you'd like, I'm trained to view the world as consisting of many animals, including humans that share a common lineage. And so in reading the literature, I saw that there's a field called neuroparasitology. So parasitology is a study of parasites. Parasites can take hold in different parts of a host's body. Neuroparasitology is when the parasite goes to your brain. It, it, it is a neuroparasite. And so I started looking at the literature of all sorts of incredible cases where an animal will be parasitized by a brain worm. So the classic example I always give, because some people might be familiar with it, is Toxoplasma gondii. It's a parasite that infects the, the brains of mice so that when the, paras the parasite is well rooted in the mouse's brain, the mouse loses its innate fear of cats and it actually becomes sexually attracted to the cat's urine. That's not a very good thing for the mouse to be attracted to a cat. It doesn't end up well for it. There's another type of parasite that attacks ungulates, deer, elk, moose. And so when the parasite is in the brain of these animals, they start engaging what's called circling behavior. They, they start going around in a circle, kind of bobbing their head, unable to extricate themselves from this motor movement, even though the looming predators are coming at it. And so as I was thinking about all these incredible, you know, almost science fiction cases of parasites that affect our ability to think, to behave in an adaptive way, I started thinking, well, there's another class of parasites that uh, infects the minds of humans other than brain worms, and those are what I call idea pathogens. So they are exactly the same concept. If you are parasitized by these one, these, one of these bad parasitic ideas, you, in a sense, behave in a maladaptive way. And so then the next thing you need to do, if you're an epidemiologist studying, say, viruses, is you say, well, where did this virus originate from? How did it spread? And so then using my epidemiologist hat, I argue that these bad ideas come from, as you correctly said, the university ecosystem. As I always remind people, it takes intellectuals to come up with really, really dumb ideas. And so then these ideas have been spreading for about 40, 50 years in the university setting, usually un unopposed. And then what we now have is these ideas making their way to journalism, to politics, to business, they're everywhere. And so I, at the end of the book, we can talk about that after, uh, I offer some vaccinations, some inoculations against these bad idea pathogens. And so then your question is, what are some of these idea pathogens? So maybe I'll mention one or two. 
Uh, postmodernism would be the granddaddy of all idea pathogens because in a sense it is the perfect pathogen of intellectual terrorism. It basically says there are no universal truths. Now scientists wake up every morning thinking that there is a truth to be discovered. Now truth can change. What, the, what was true in science 500 years ago has been revised. So everything is provisionally true. So we are humble enough to accept the fact that what I think is true today might no longer be true tomorrow, but we do wake up every day saying, I think there is a truth to be discovered out there. Well, postmodernism completely blows that edifice apart and says that no, you're completely constrained by your subjectivity, by your personal biases and so on. So that is a deeply parasitic idea because it basically removes if you sense, it removes the shackles of reality from your epistemology, right? So you get people who question that whether it is men or women who can bear children. A great story that I tell, uh, this happened in 2002. Do, do you want to interject or can I go on with my story? Is that a- go ahead, go ahead. Oh, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, so in 2002, I had uh, one of my doctoral students had just defended his uh, doctoral dissertation. And so we decided that we were gonna go out to celebrate. And it was myself, my wife, my doctoral student and his, his date for that evening. And he warned me before we went out that his date for that evening was a graduate student who was studying radical feminism, postmodernism and cultural anthropology, sort of the holy trinity of mm-hmm. bullshit. Yep. And, so, and so he said, you know, let's try to have a good evening, you know, I said, okay, no problem. Don't worry. I will be on my best behavior. I promise, which of course was not true. And so during the evening, I said, you know, let me try to see if I can softly question this person. So I said to this person, I hear that you are a postmodernist. Do you, so you don't believe that there are any universals, correct? No, no universals. Okay. So do you mind if I maybe propose some universals and then you could tell me how I'm wrong? She said, absolutely. Go for it. Okay, is it, is it a universal that within Homo sapiens, humans, only women bear children? Is that not a universal? And she said, so she kind of looked at me in disgust at my blatant biological sexism and said, absolutely not. I said, it's not true. It's not true that only women bear children. She said, no. And there is some tribe in Japan off some island where within the spiritual realm, within the folklore of their spiritual realm, it is the men who bear children. So by you restricting the conversation to the biological realm, this is how you keep us sort of shackled by biology. So after I recovered from this nonsense, I suggested another possibility. Okay, let's put aside controversial cases like bearing children. Uh, Let me give you one more example, I said to her. Is it true that within any vantage point on earth, Sailors, since time immemorial, have relied on the fact that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. So here she used, a, a, if you like, a sub-branch of postmodernism called deconstruction, deconstructionism, where she said, well, these are labels. What do you mean east? What do you mean west? What do you mean sun? What you call the sun, I may call dancing hyena. I said, okay, well, the dancing hyena rises in the east and sets in the west. And she said, I don't play those kinds of label games. So here you had a graduate student 18 years ago who wasn't willing to accept that women bear children, right? So we better go to medical schools and tell them that it's not true that women bear children. And who wasn't willing to accept that there is such a thing as East and West and there's such a thing as the sun. She wasn't out of a mental institution. She was out of a postmodernist program. So this in a sense is the perfect idea pathogen because it goes into your neural circuitry and it basically rewires everything so that up is down, left is right, gravity doesn't exist, everything is a social construction. So that's one example. Do you want me to give you a few more or do you want to interject? Let me interject real quick. Sure. What, is, what is the difference between that mindset and simply playing word games? Because right now it is, it is really tough to find out if there's actually an underlying motive behind that kind of behavior. Um, so, so what is, what's, what's the difference between, um, you know, the, 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 let's, let's call it like the evil, um, idea behind it, or just simply playing word games to win an argument. It it is word games. And I've actually theorized that because one, one has to ask what could have been in the minds 
of the original postmodernists and the the, right. the, the grand the, the the holy trinity of postmodernist bs are french postmodernists jacques derrida jacques lacan and michel foucault and so i was thinking well surely these are you think intelligent people so how did they get away with this stuff and my theorizing is as follows i and, and I, by the way i think it's an it's an evolutionary explanation so they're walking around on campuses and all the glory and all the prestige is going to the physicists and the chemists and the biologists and the mathematicians. Well, I don't like that, right? I also want to be a peacock. I'm speaking now as a French postmodernist. I also want to create a language that is impenetrable. So this speaks to your word game question, right? So if you read a mathematical paper or a physics paper, if you don't understand the language of mathematics within the first sentence, you're already out of the game. You're already right. lost. How about I create an equally impenetrable game called postmodernism, which is full of nonsensical gibberish, but where you are actually lost within the first paragraph. I know of endless students, including my wife once admitted this to me, that where when they were studying postmodernism, they always they, they were never always confused. They never understood a single word of it. And they always attributed to them being dumb, right? But there's a second option, which is that the person who is espousing these theories is a complete charlatan fraud. But the natural instinct is to say, if I don't understand this fancy professor, it must be because I am dumb rather than he's saying gibberish. And so to answer your question in a long-winded way, it's all word game, it's all nihilism, it's all intellectual terrorism. It has polluted the minds of generations of students stolen the tuition funds from parents who worked hard to send their kids to school to school to learn nothing wow yeah i mean it is um what is what is the underlying like i mean there are there are the individual motivations to do that uh, as you explained but what is the the danger to to society for that like let's let's be devil's advocate here yeah and let's say What if, what if that's, uh, you know, isn't that a good thing? You know, everybody has their own little truth. Um, right. Everybody lives, lives happily, you know, in the, in, the, in the feeling that they speak truth. Uh, what's, what could be wrong with that? Right. So many things. So one would be that you and I are able to have this conversation because if you imagine the Venn diagrams from your elementary school, there is an intersection. There is a place where we can meet, where we understand that the word cat means cat where we understand that if you jump off a building, there is something that's called gravity that's going to result in the exact same thing if we do it a hundred times. So by having shared meaning, by having a shared understanding of statistical regularities, it allows us to communicate. If we no longer have the intersecting Venn diagram, then it's complete nihilism, right? Uh, uh, men with nine inch penises could be called women, right? Uh, now, again, this doesn't mean by the way that uh, some people A few people wrongly think when I criticize transgender activism, for example, or oh, I'm transphobic, nothing could be further from the truth. I'm a strong supporter of individual rights for everybody. Any bigotry is bad. But that doesn't mean that in the service of pursuing justice, we murder truth, right? So the idea that I have to appear in front of the Canadian Senate in 2017 so that I can demonstrate to the Canadian senators that no, no, there is such a thing called male. There is such a thing called female. And males come with this type of, I mean, it's ridiculous that in the 21st century we need it. But to answer your question, I had to do that because many of them were completely parasitized by all these idiotic idea pathogens. So there is a huge danger to this because we are a communicating animal. Our prefrontal cortex is, is expecting that we could meet in the middle to share ideas. Postmodernism throws that out the window. Cultural relativism throws that out the window. Now you might say more generally, but why do people hold these ideas? Well, I think that I, I have a general explanation and that is that each of these idea pathogens frees us from the shackles of reality. So let's go back to social constructivism. It's a very hopeful message to think that any child born anywhere could be anything if only they had the right environment, right? If you hug your child enough or you don't hug him enough or you give him a right amount of milk, he or she can grow up to be the next Lionel Messi or the next Albert Einstein. That's a hopeful message. It, it removes right. the shackles of my unique potentiality because we could all be the next Lionel Messi. 
but this is BS, right? The reality is I didn't stand an equal chance to become the next NBA superstar the way Michael Jordan did. He had a starting line that was ahead of me, but that feels wrong. It feels unfair because it makes more sense that we are all born with equal potentiality. It makes more sense that we all have our unique truths. There is no universal truth. So each of these idea pathogens might start off from a noble place, but it's complete nonsense. Well, yeah, Ayn Rand uh, said you can ignore reality, but you cannot ignore the consequences of ignoring reality, right? Exactly right. Um, there is there is something you said that's a hopeful message, and I, on first hand, agree with that. But I also think that there is also a sinister message in that because if everything can be changed, if nothing is inherent, you basically say that you can change other people and that other people have the full potential of changing and this this makes you know you if you you know see any traits which you don't find desirable in other people that puts you if you're in a, in a position of power um, in a spot where you can basically exert pressure on them in the expectation that they might change and we can actually see that uh, in in public discourse today when it comes to cancel culture and everything everything like that What is, what is your stance on, on cancel culture right now? And what is the connection between cancel culture and uh, this relativism or this yeah. postmodernism? Well, so many of these idea pathogens, regrettably, uh, are not open to the free exchange of ideas, right? Because they truly believe that they hold sort of the... Ironically, they think, despite the fact that they are cultural relativists, that they hold the universal moral position, right? And so rather than saying, okay, uh, Felix, you think one thing and I think another, let's step into the, uh, the boxing ring of ideas, let's debate and may the per person win, the best ideas win. What they are doing basically through cancel culture is they are doing what happens in the Middle East where I escaped from, but instead of executing you for the wrong ideas, they execute your reputation they execute your job. So they don't yet have the ability to send you to Gulag 13, but what they can do is metaphorically end your life, your livelihood, your reputation. It's grotesque, it has to stop. You can't imagine, Felix, the number of messages that I receive on a daily basis from students, you, are, you guys are students for liberty, from students, from faculty, from parents of students, who are completely lost because they can't make sense of what's happening in their reality. Exactly because of what we talked about earlier, because they come equipped with a certain understanding of the world and all these idea pathogens are throwing everything into chaos. And so cancel culture is a dreadful thing. And hopefully people will start collectively developing the courage to speak out against it. I think one of the problems is that very few of us in academia Uh, have the courage to actually stand up and say, I won't tolerate this. So what ends up happening is that most people subcontract that fight to a few people, even though the silent majority is on our side. And so they will send me an email and say, hey, I really, my name is Dr. So-and-so, I really support you, but please don't tell anybody that I support you. And I'm thinking, right. well, well, I mean, you, you, you're, you're unsure about whether you should be supporting someone who supports freedom of speech and equal rights for women. And what are you ashamed of? Right? No, but I'm controversial. I'm a, I have a big mouth. My, the chair of my department might be upset if they hear that, that I support Gatsad. And therefore they eat, they all keep quiet. And so it seems that there's only three or four of us who hold these positions where the reality is most of us hold these positions, but few of us are courageous enough to say so. Is this a problem in academia in general, or is it just the humanities? Because I, I imagine that, you know, I'm, I, for example, I, I'm at a business school. Um, we do not have that much of a problem with that. Um, also in engineering, I heard that there is not a whole lot of problem with that. Um, what makes certain departments more susceptible to those ideas? Yeah, that's a great question. It actually speaks exactly to your Ayn Rand quote from earlier, which is, these types of idea pathogens are more likely to, to start and spread in disciplines that are perfectly decoupled from the consequences of their BS, right? right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it's exactly that, right? So, so I'm also housed in a business school. So in the business school, you can't afford the luxury of spouting BS because there's a bottom line. If you're developing finance models or economic models 
or quantitative marketing models that are fully decoupled from reality, you're not going to survive long. If you build bridges as an engineer that are decoupled from physics laws, it's not going to go well for that bridge or if you're an aerospace engineer. So the reason, your intuition is exactly correct. The reason why engineering schools and business schools are less likely to be parasitized by this kind of stupidity is precisely because there are consequences to that stupidity. But when I'm in the humanities and I'm sitting in my highfalutin ivory tower I can, and I'm smoking a pipe with a cognac and spewing bullshit, then there are no consequences to my stupidity. There, there, there literally are no consequences. And so, the, the, the idea pathogen can quickly spread so that after a few years, every single student is mimicking this kind of, this kind of nonsense. I have sat on committees where I uh, evaluate graduate uh, research grants from these types of students. It's absolutely insane. I mean, you would think it's, it's satire. It is so decoupled from reality. It's literally a form of collective psychosis. It's insane. What I realized is that there is some, there are, the, those departments I just mentioned, uh, engineering and business, um, those are not entirely immune uh, to those pathogens either. There's like not, a, they, they can't seal themselves from that. Um, what I realized is that um, in business, we have a lot of that stuff coming in through HR departments. Um, also, what I realized is that there is a problem with business school rankings, for example, because, you know, back in the day back in the day there was there were like um the the rankings were based on how well you teach how much money your graduates make and so on now there's also some some degree of quotas like okay what kind of like how many uh, what's the gender split in this program um or what is what is the what is the split of foreign born individuals and that way those rankings can actually steer policy in those universities um, so this is this is what I what I see very as, as a very let's say frightening thing um, because no matter if we want to or not we kind of have to deal with this. Yeah. No, you're, you sorry. Did you finish your question? Yeah, yeah. 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 No, you're exactly right. And so you mentioned HR departments. So this is I would put this under one one of my idea pathogens from the book. Uh, what I call the die religion die is an acronym, D-I-E, for diversity, inclusion, and equity, right? And so now all of the grants, all of your, you know, all of your uh, interventions as a professor has to be mindful of these DIE quotas, right? So I know, for example, of uh, professors in the natural sciences who have uh, had grants rejected because when they had to fill out the DIE components, they didn't do a good job explaining how they're going to bring in people from different diverse backgrounds and so on. And so they didn't even look at the rest of the scientific grant, the merit of the grant. They only looked at, did you adhere to die or not? So, so I think that while it is true that the engineering school and the business school and so on might be less uh, likely to be parasitized by these ideas, no one is safe it eventually makes its way to all of the halls of the academic world. And do you think meritocracy as a concept is in danger? I think it's kind of a, like a rhetorical question to a degree because I believe that it is. Um, since, I mean, your, for example, the sexual orientation has no bearing on if you're able to do the job properly or not, uh, which is meritocracy, right? I mean, um, do you think that in the long run we will see um, other like in business, for example, you, you teach as a business school. Um, in business, do we see other values put forth um, other than a meritocracy? Well, it, it, you're exactly right that the Dai religion is uh, antithetical to a meritocracy. And I actually speak about this in my forthcoming book, The Parasitic Mind, uh, because it basically says that it doesn't matter how good your CV is. If you hold certain immutable characteristics that are not currently scoring high on the oppression Olympics game, then you don't, get, you don't get whatever you applied for. Now, this doesn't just apply for you know, some in, you know, in, inconsequential uh, application. I mean, chaired professorships, right? Chaired professorships is the highest level of professor that you can be. Chaired professorships are determined in some, in some element 
as a function of where you score on these die metrics. And so you now have universities all over the West that basically say, you can only apply if you are a woman or you self-identify as a woman. And it is done in such a banal way that people don't even stop for a second and say, how is that not illegal? Well, they argue that it's not illegal because there's been systematic oppression of various groups. And the only way that now we can redress that situation is to engage in reverse sexism or racism. It's grotesque, right? What makes the West so beautiful is that as long as you have equality of opportunities, then we should all be able to jump into the ring and compete. But of course, as you certainly know, and some of your viewers know, the problem is we're conflating equality of opportunities with equality of outcomes, right? So I often use satire in my interventions. So I always say, why is it that FIFA, the, the World Soccer Association, why are they so racist that they've only had eight countries ever win the World Cup? There is, right, well, how come Namibia hasn't won? When are we gonna let Japan win, right? Now, of course, people understand this to be utterly insane, right? I mean, why is it that only Messi and Ronaldo and Modric for one year won the uh, Ballon d'Or, the best player of the world over the past year? What about a transgender person of color? How come they're not winning? But somehow uh, in sports, it seems like it's a bit more difficult to make that argument because the competition is so clearly cut. But in other disciplines or other areas of competition, no, we have to, by the way, I said sports and that's not even true because now you have biological males who self-identify as female competing against biological females and winning and people don't see anything wrong with that. So in the, in the pursuit of protecting the right of this transgender person, you squash the rights of all of the biological females who are losing. This is what I call tyranny of the minority. Nobody is saying that this transgender person doesn't exist or doesn't have rights, but then let them fight, he or she fight a competition against people who are similarly to him biologically. But we have even MMA, right? I mean, fighting competition. Yeah. I mean, you've probably heard of these. Helen I mean, Fox, yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, is it not insane that in the 21st century, people don't have an internal compass to, to, to say, you know, it doesn't seem to make sense that a biological male who is twice as physically strong, and doesn't matter how much hormone blockers you give, there is already a trajectory that's been set. You think that that's okay for someone like that to fight against a biological female? You don't see anything inherently unjust about this? This is exactly what I mean by idea pathogens. I mean, it, it, comes, from, it comes from basically saying that, all right, since male and female are not categories we deal with anymore i mean the floodgates are pretty much open if you if you if you, yeah. if you basically say that and there is no difference in upper body strengths in, in in males and females then it's completely natural to let them fight each other but that's and, and, not how, how reality works right and you could see how your original question of so what's the danger of postmodernism there you have it right uh, strength is a social construction uh, hormones are a social construction right uh, who are we to say why Bubba, who is a 350 pound linesman for the Dallas Cowboys, why does he bench press more than a 120 pound girl? There's actually feminists who would argue that that difference in how much you could bench press is not due to any physiological. It's because Bubba, the male, was encouraged and nurtured by his parents to play rough and tumble when he was a child. So that encouraged his physicality. Whereas little Linda was encouraged to play softly with her dolls. And that's what resulted 20 years later in Bubba being able to bench press 800 pounds. It's not because there are any physiological, anatomical or morphological differences between Bubba and Linda. When you're able to make such insane statements, you've entered the abyss of infinite lunacy. You, um, you talked about, I mean, you as an evolutionary psychologist deal with, um, you know, biological difference, sex differences every day. Um, but what is, what is your way of actually figuring out if a difference is inherently, you know, is inherited or is socially constructed? Can you um, talk about, for example, the, the hourglass figure, how you basically determine that this is sure. not socially constructed? Oh, that's a fantastic question. So uh, in... Uh, the second to last chapter of my uh, of the parasitic mind, I have a chapter where I talk about you know, how do you seek truth, 
how do you establish an argument? And so I'm gonna to come to the hourglass example in a second, but I wanna kind of set it up. Uh, and so I argue basically that there is a way by which I can collect so much evidence coming from different disciplines, different time periods, different cultures, different methodologies. And if they all point to the same final conclusion, then I have built an insurmountable tsunami of evidence in support of my position. And so I call this nomological networks of cumulative evidence. And if we go back about 150 years, Charles Darwin, who you know, wrote on, on the origin of species, when he was trying to argue for the theory of natural selection, that's exactly what he did. I mean, he didn't call it nomological networks of cumulative evidence, but what he basically did is he collected data over many decades from many different disciplines, from paleontology, from animal husbandry, from biodiversity, uh, from entomology, and all of the evidence once put together made it seem incontrovertible that he was on the right path. And after 150 years, people have tried to falsify his theories and they haven't been able to do so. So now let's go to the hourglass figure. So if I wanna prove to you, Felix, that the hourglass figure preference that men hold for women's shapes is an adaptation, it's an evolutionary preference, how would I go about doing that? Okay, so then I would put on my hat now of someone who's trying to build that cumulative evidence. So I could get data from medicine that shows that women who hold that hourglass figure are, are, like, are more likely to be younger. Uh, our shape, our, the hourglass get worsens with age, are more likely to be nubile, fertile. So that's medical data. I can get data from art where I could look at statues from multiple cultures spanning several millennia, and I can do a content analysis on those figurines to show that all these different cultures from many different time periods seem to define the beauty of a woman's shape in exactly the same way. By the way, the hourglass figure is a waist to hip ratio of 0.68 to roughly 0.72. I could get data from neuroimaging study where you put men through the fMRI to, to measure their neural activation patterns. And I could show that the pleasure center of men are more likely to light up when they view images of women possessing that hourglass figure. I can get data from around the world. So it's not just Germany or Canada or US. I could go to the Yanomomo tribe in the middle of the Amazon, show them different pictures, and they will agree that that particular woman has the nicest shape. And I could go on and on with many more such examples, but I'll end with one final one. This, this is not a study done by me, but it's, it's an amazing one because it shows you how you could build such networks. You could take congenitally blind men. So these are men who've never had the gift of sight, meaning they couldn't have been socialized. It's not due to Elle magazine or Hollywood images or Beyonce videos that they love the hourglass. And you could take congenitally blind men and show that they prefer the same hourglass figure. How do we measure their preferences? We use mannequins where they touch the mannequins and they choose the one that has the hourglass. So look already how many different data sources I brought for you that all points to the exact same thing. And I've only given you a small sample of the evidence. So I tell people when you are trying to make arguments or you're engaged in debates, don't be hysterical, don't be emotional, don't try to win the argument by screaming the louder. Say, what would be the data that I would need to collect to absolutely prove my point? Now, the problem with my approach, if I can be honest and say that there is a problem, is that it does presuppose that at least people are honest enough to be open to that evidence, that they're honest enough to engage that process. If I go like this, la, 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 I don't want to hear it, then even all of my attempts to try to persuade you are going to fall on deaf ears. You follow? Yeah. Let's play, let's play devil's advocate a little sure. bit. Um, so when we talk about evolutionary psychology um, and that we, we are influenced by the traits we inherit, um, what is the difference between that and biological determinism? Basically saying that our, our, you know, our genes and the makeup of our genes determines what we do on a daily basis? Yes, beautiful question, because that's one of the uh, attacks that people levy wrongly against evolutionary psychology. It, exactly what you said, biological or genetic determinism. And that actually demonstrates that people don't understand biology because 
let me draw a, uh, a nice uh, metaphor. Or, or an, yeah, a metaphor. so take a cake, okay? If you start off with the ingredients before you make the cake, each of the ingredients are separate. There is the eggs, there's the flour, there's the butter, there's the baking pot, whatever, right? They're separate. Now I make the cake. And then I tell you, please point to the sugar or the eggs. You can't. It's an inextricable mix, right? It's a perfect melange. So the reality is that we are both a inextricable mix of our genes and our uh, environments. As a matter of fact, even, envir even our genes are turned on or off as a function of specific environmental inputs. So there is no biological determinism. What there is are universal patterns, but that can be malleable. So for example, we know that around the world, men are much more likely to compete against one another in seeking status because around the world, women rate status as one of the things most important to them in choosing a male. So that's the universal, but, so to argue against biological determinism, but the manner by which status is defined varies across people, across cultures, right? And what, and maybe in the West, status is determined by whether I have a PhD from an Ivy League school or how many zeros I have in my bank account or whether I have an Aston Martin. Each of those measures of status mean nothing to the Hadza tribe in Africa where the number of cattle head I have might be what determines, right? So you and I might both seek status, but you may become a famous lawyer I may become a famous soccer player. We've each instantiated the seeking status through completely different ways. So the idea of biological determinism is a nonsensical idea. Evolutionary psychologists don't argue that we are robots to our genes. They simply say that there is such a thing as genes that interact with the environment. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And in my, in my practice, I, I also do coach uh, I'll do coach and I cover that a lot in, right. in, my, in my coaching practice. So um, it makes, it makes a lot of sense when it comes to evolutionary psychology, you do, uh, you apply this in academic setting and you try to translate that into, into business. What do you think is the, the next so-called frontier? Um, where do you see evolutionary psychology applied in the next decades and where can it actually help everybody? You know, your average Joe on the street, where can, where can knowledge of um, evolution and psychology help there? Love these questions, Felix. Good job. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, I just wrote a paper that's coming out in a journal called Evolutionary Behavioral Sciences, I think in October, where my whole article is exactly answering this question, sort of the future of evolution psychology. And so I argue in this uh, paper two things. Number one, I argue that we have to permanently kill, the kill metaphorically, not literally, kill the detractors of evolutionary psychology. So all of the stuff that we talked about earlier, why people hate evolutionary psychology, it doesn't make sense that every generation of evolutionary psychologists have to kill the same phoenix and then the phoenix rises again with the next generation of idiocy, right? So that's one. But the second part of that paper answers exactly your question, which is what's the future of evolutionary psychology in terms of its application? And I actually argue that uh, evolutionary psychologists have not wrongly, but have spent a lot of time tackling some of the sort of most natural questions, mating behavior, right? Because that seems to fit very nicely with the Darwinian perspective. Mating is a very basal biological choice that you make. But the, the opportunities to apply the evolutionary lens in applied feed, fields is endless, and it hasn't been nearly applied to the extent that I'd like to see it. So for example, in how you design legal frameworks. Legal frameworks are either good or not as a function of whether they violate tenets of human nature or not. In business, let me give you an example of someone who tried to develop a product without an understanding of evolutionary psychology. So I can't remember the name of the company, but there was a company that was progressive that was trying to develop a new line of romance novels so for your viewers who don't know around the world, so it is a universal, it is predominantly women who read romance novels. And, and in a sense, it's kind of the, it's pornography for the ladies, right? right. Uh, and, and so if you want to study female psychology, 
study the content of romance novels, it will tell you a lot about human universals of female mate choice. And so this one company was very interested in breaking the shackles of, you know, uh, stereotypes of masculinity. Because by the way, the archetype of the male hero in every single romance novel is exactly the same guy. It's, it's literally like plagiarism. It's cut and paste. He is tall. He is a neurosurgeon. He's also a prince. He, uh, he is very uh, reckless in his risk-taking. He wrestles alligators on his six-pack stomach, and he could only be tamed by the love of this one good woman. I just told you every single romance novel that's ever existed. Well, so this company wanted to create a new version of masculinity, precisely because they thought people are infinitely malleable. If I could teach you how to be a new thing, then you will abide by my teaching. Tabula rasa. So they created a version of romance novels where the male is more gentle, where he cries, where he watches Bridget Jones' diary eight times, eating ice cream and sucking his thumb. And guess what? The market said, uh, no, I'm not interested in this product. I don't want to fantasize about that guy. So here's an example. Via, here's a way of answering your question with a very concrete, tangible example. If marketers and product designers are perfectly decoupled from an understanding of human nature, they will create products that will ultimately fail in the marketplace, which goes back to our earlier point. If you're in business, you can't really be parasitized by idiocy because there's a bottom line. So whether it be in medicine, whether it be in law, whether it be in business, you can't study anything involving biological beings without the evolutionary lens. So I see the future of evolutionary psychology as being incredibly exciting because I suspect that in a hundred years, what you and I are talking about today in terms of the controversy of evolution psychology will be nothing. Everybody will say, yeah, no kidding. Of course, evolution matters. Yeah, I found that, I found that very interesting because um, when, I was, when I was starting off uh, in my kind of political, um, you know, becoming a political thinking adult, I was always thinking that the, the right was anti-science in the way because they rejected evolution. And now I see that the left also rejects the revolution on that point. So it is, it is very interesting times. Um, I have, have one question. Let's shift gears a little bit. Um, yeah. What is your, what is your um, take on freedom of speech? We had um, students, uh, Students for Liberty, were um, all about freedom of speech. Um, and what is, what is your take on that? How, so how a, far should that go? Yes. So I'm a, I'm a true free speech absolutist. And the best way that I can explain this, and, and usually I find that the example I'm about to give really drives the point home. For, for the viewers who may not know about my personal history and personal background, we are Lebanese Jews who had to right. escape Lebanon because we're Jewish. Uh, it's going to be relevant that I'm Jewish in a second in the example I give. And so there is no more offensive speech than denying the Holocaust. Right? right, because it's the singular historical event that is the most grotesque. It's the systematic industrial scale level annihilation of a people. The historical records are very clear. So there can't be a greater offense to truth than the denial of the Holocaust. And yet here, I hope everybody's sitting down and focusing. I'm a Jewish person who supports the right of Holocaust deniers to deny the Holocaust. There can't be a greater commitment to free speech. As you would expect, there are little uh, asterisks. Which you cannot uh, libel or defame someone. I can't go on my large platforms and say, uh, Felix is a uh, child killer. And here is, I've got proof. I'm live. It's, it's wrong. I'm damaging your reputation. I cannot engage in an incitement to violence. Let's go and round up the Jews and kill them. That's not protected by free speech. So short of a few examples that everybody should know about, inciting violence, uh, you know, screaming fire in the proverbial theater, lab uh, libel and defamation, everything is open. The best way to defeat your stupidity, your racism, your bigotry, is for it to be out into the open so I could squash it. And so I am an absolute free speech absolutist. Do you think that in, in jurisdictions where it is not allowed to um, have full freedom of speech, for example, in Germany, it is illegal and punishable by law to, um, to say that the Holocaust never happened. 
Um, do you think that people who actually do that and get punished by law actually get some like kind of mar like status of a martyr that they, you know, that they get pretty much the, all their followers railed like behind them and in, in support because. Absolutely. Yeah. Of course, because then they're, they're seen as the victim, right? Exactly. It, it, it makes a lot more sense for me for you to spew your stupidity so I could then, you know, take my gun of truth and destroy you in the battle of ideas, right? Nothing should be publicly. Yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Publicly. Right. I remember, I think it was maybe now almost 10 years ago, there was an evolutionary psychologist at, uh, in psychology today. He had a column on psychology today that was very, very popular. His name is Satoshi Kanazawa. He's no longer a blogger at psychology today. He had written an article. He's at the London school of economics, by the way, he had written an article where he was, uh, describing research done by someone else where they had looked at how people rate the beauty of, you know, black males, white males, black females, white. So you could imagine how that can be a very uh, touchy subject. Yep. And so, he, you know, he, he used a bit of language that was sensationalist and a bit bombastic and so on. But he was literally just reporting data that someone else had collected and analyzed. And the world went completely insane. They said, let's, this guy has to be basically canceled. Before there was a term called cancel culture, he might have been one of the original, you know, victims of cancel culture. Now he wasn't let go from his position at London School of Economics, but he was purged from psychology today. And I had written an article, uh, which you could still find online, where I had said that purging a blogger sets a very dangerous precedent. If Satoshi Kanazawa has said some really wrong things and some racist things, what better way to punish him than to keep his article up for the end of times? There is nothing that you could punish him more than to keep that if, if it is truly racist. So cancel culture is horrible. Hate speech laws are horrible. Look, I get attacked endlessly by all kinds of horrible people uh, for, for being Jewish and so on. I don't like it. it, it bothers me, it's annoying. It can be sometimes very threatening. But as long as you don't truly say, let's round up the Jews and kill them, people have a right to be racists and idiots and imbeciles in a free society. That's the messiness of a free society. And I mean, they will, if they do that in the open, they will suffer the consequences of that. Exactly. This is, this is, I mean, uh, this is how it works. And um, what, I, what I believe is we are seeing that if ideas are in, you're not out in the open, and which are completely unsupervised by the public, they can actually be more dangerous. And in, in Germany, for example, it is we have very tough laws against. Um, I, I told you um, on on this very like neo-Nazi um, yeah. uh, speech, and those guys are pretty much they are not out in the open, but they're still there, and yeah. their ideas are still there. And this is what makes them very uncontrollable and you know off the radar. Um, what do you think of uh, the current state of freedom of speech uh, in the West? It's not, it's, uh, if, if, if freedom of speech were a person going to see their physician, they're not in good health. They need to go on a diet. They need to exercise more. Uh, look, I think what happens is that people in their daily lives go about their business so that they don't tie the general patterns together, right? So, uh, you know, I'm busy with my work and my daughter has her graduation and this. Let somebody else worry about freedom of speech. I mean, I'm speaking now as the, the yeah. average person who doesn't care, right? And, but the reality is that it's, it's akin. So maybe I could use here a, a marketing example. So there's something in marketing called the just noticeable difference. The just noticeable difference is what is the minimal level at which a change in the intensity of a stimulus will be picked up by people. So for example, if, I, if the music is set at 20 decibels and I now lower it to 15 decibels, are you able to pick up the change? If yes, then it passed your just noticeable difference. So how do marketers use this? And I'm gonna come back to freedom of speech. Don't worry, yeah. I haven't forgotten what the question is. But, but I elaborate, always... elaborate. Let's exactly. learn something here. Yeah, so uh, let's suppose I am a candy bar manufacturer and I want to increase the price of the candy bar. But if I increase the price, that's a very salient attribute. Consumers are attuned to the price. If it's a dollar and you increase it to a dollar 25, I notice that. So how else can I reduce the price or increase the price of the product? I could reduce the size of the offering. If currently the, the, the candy bar is 
80 grams. Maybe if I reduce it to 70 grams, and most people can't pick up the difference between 80 and 70, then that's a good way for me to you know, slip it under the just noticeable difference. So now going back to freedom of speech, that's exactly how freedom of speech gets intruded upon. It's what my, the original title of my book was going to be Death of the West by a Thousand Cuts. One cut, you don't notice. Two cuts, you don't notice. A, th- a hundred cuts, you don't notice. Yeah. Suddenly you wake up after a thousand cuts and you're dead. And so this is what's happening with freedom of speech is that each intrusion and violation of freedom of speech goes under the radar. But then you wake up one day and you're unable to say, what do you mean men can menstruate? As per J.K. Rowling, where she said, no, I don't think that men can menstruate. And I don't think it's so controversial to say that. She gets canceled. A billionaire author gets canceled for arguing that only women can menstruate. So to answer your question in a very long-winded way, freedom of speech is something that, as Ronald Reagan said, that we have to defend every generation because there's always someone who is trying to take your free societies and turn it into unfree societies. So we're not in a good shape. Basically, freedom of speech right now has diabetes, and we need to give it some insulin shots to revive it. Let's let's uh, talk about that. How do we how do we re- revive that? Do we uh, do we need anybody to become a ferocious uh, honey badgers of liberty in that case? Uh, <laughs> oh, I love that you're using those terms. Activate your honey badger, your inner honey badger, chapter eight. Uh, yes, you do. That's exactly right. Uh, look, at the end of every day, pe- people ask me, you know, why is it that I, you know, engage in this battle? It causes me a lot of stress. My blood pressure goes up. I get pissed off. I could live a much more peaceful life if I just go about doing my professorial work and let someone else worry about it. Well, because I think I'm in a perpetual state of honey badgerhood, which is I despise lies. I despise attacks on freedom because I come from a culture where we didn't have the same freedoms. And so I really do love and appreciate what the West has to offer for people like me, hundreds of million who would love to be participants in the West. And so what I tell people is don't be apathetic, don't be cowardly, activate your inner honey badger. Now that doesn't mean that everybody has a big platform or is a fancy professor or can get on Joe Rogan, but you could affect change at your own local level. If you're interacting with someone on Facebook and they say something that is insane, engage them politely. Don't walk away thinking, but then I'll be canceled by them, but then they won't be my friend, but then they won't block me. There's always an excuse for why I shouldn't get engaged, right? So for example, I get tons of people who write to me, but Dr. Saad, uh, I'm right now doing my PhD, I'm afraid, or I'm, I, I'm now an assistant professor, I don't have tenure, or I'm, I now have tenure, but I wanna get a full professorship. There's always a reason why you should keep quiet because otherwise you won't get your next promotion or whatever. But that's putting your selfish interests above the collective interests of our society, right? It's not easy for me to speak out the way that I do. It causes me great strain. I've lost a lot of things. So people say, oh, but you're tenured. There's no, nobody can get you. Well, I had to file a report with the Montreal police because I was getting death threats. I had to go to campus and the security had to be with me. You think? Tenure protects me from that, right? So we all have a cost to bear, but if we collectively build that courage to speak up, we can redress the ship very quickly. If we don't do that, we'll wake up one day in 10, 20, 50 years, and we'll say, I wish I had done it differently. We at Students for Liberty, we fight for those uh, freedoms pretty much every day. And we sometimes, I sometimes um, realize that uh, freedom is taken for granted, right? Do you think that your cultural background enables you to have a different view on on the basic freedoms which we enjoy in the West? 100%. Look, I think that even if I had not had my background, just my unique combination of genes who that make up Gatsad is that I'm a fighter, right? I, I, you know, it's maybe it's part because I'm from the Middle East, but it's also just because of who I am. Some people are tall, some people are short, some people fight, some people don't. But I definitely think that the fact that I come from that background allows me to understand the full buffet of available societies, right? If you've grown up in the West, never having known anything other than freedom, if you've grown up in the West, 
not knowing the feeling of having to hide your religious identity because things can go wrong against you if somebody finds out that you've got the dark secret of being Jewish, then you can't even relate. You don't even know that these things exist, right? An ant in my garden doesn't know that there is the Eiffel Tower. It doesn't know that such a thing exists. So the problem I think in the West, and regrettably most of the social justice warriors are usually very privileged kids who go to very fancy schools who don't know how well they have it in the West. And that's what angers me, right? Why don't you go to Yemen for a couple of weeks and then talk to me about all the stuff that you're protesting about? Why don't you go to, I have a, a good friend of mine. Her name is uh, Ansaf. She's the uh, wife of Raif Badawi. Raif Badawi is the, yeah, the Saudi, Saudi Arabia, yeah. Exactly. I mean, imagine the courage that this gentleman had, which wow. is yeah. to speak out against some Saudi issues while he is in Saudi Arabia. That's a honey badger. That's a king honey badger, okay? So don't tell me about you have tenure, you don't have tenure, you're worried about your PhD, about your assistant professor. There are people in the Middle East who put their lives literally on the line to fight for the freedoms that everybody in the West takes for granted. So, so yes, of course, my background matters. And that's why I think I'm a good messenger for this. Don't let the West result in the same trajectory of, as that which I fled in Lebanon. Yeah, and also you can't really be attacked uh, in terms of the oppression Olympics, right? Uh, I'm, you have I'm more the king points. of oppression. You have more points. <laughs> All right, we're going to open um, the questions up to the audience now. So if anybody is, you know, um, watching this, feel free to, um, you know, ask your questions. And I'm, I'm just going to look through them a little bit and just give you... Um, I see points. 12 chats. Am I supposed to be clicking there or am I supposed to be... And so... Uh, let I, I would i would actually say that i post the question but if you want to you can review them but it's uh kind i'd rather of chaotic. focus on you it's always chaotic so uh let's let's so i'll just focus on you. you you take care of the curation of the questions all right so uh question by florian how would you assess the current situation and development of grievance studies throughout canadian universities compared to the ones in the u.s especially because of the political climate in the u.s right now uh i think that so the, so for those of you who don't know the grievance studies is the collection of disciplines, all of which are rooted in grievance, right? So uh, ethnic studies, uh, women's studies, fat studies, right? So, so for example, there's now a movement in, I mean, literally called fat studies, where the idea is that it is grotesque to argue medically that being grossly overweight is a medical problem. You are medicalizing my personhood. It is a form of bigotry to do that. Really? We don't know already that being, uh, how many people who are 100 years old are 300 pounds overweight? One thing that 100 year old people usually have in common is that they're very thin. Now, I'm someone who could stand to lose 30 or 40 pounds. My physician reminds me every year that I used to be a soccer player and I used to have a lot less weight. And how insensitive. I, how insensitive. <laughs> and I, I usually say it's, he, he is such a fattest to put me on the scale. Weight, by the way, here's a great story very quickly. Uh, I had once written uh, as a tweet, uh, you know, why does my physician tell me I need to lose weight? Doesn't he know that weight is just a social construction? Of course, I was being sarcastic. And so when I went to see him for my yearly physical, he takes out his iPad and I, I thought that we were going to go over the numbers, you know, my cholesterol level and so on. Uh, he goes, no, 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 everything is good. Uh, but uh, I'm worried about something else. I said, okay, well, what? He, he pulls out my tweet and he shows it to me. He didn't know that I was being sarcastic. So he thought I was insane. What do, what do you mean? <laughs> I actually discussed this in the book. So, so, so to answer your question, I think grievance studies is a problem everywhere in the West where a lot of these idea pathogens have taken root. I'd like to think, I don't have empirical evidence, but I think that it's slightly on the way down. So for example, if I look at postmodernism in the early 90s, there was a lot more postmodernist infusion in many disciplines, but I think it's still there. It'll still take a few generations before we can eradicate the pathogen permanently. Yeah. And I think in, in Germany, it usually for every trend, it takes about four years to, to cross the pond thoroughly. So we, we're, we're not, we're not, um, we still have the, the peak. Uh, okay, we'll, right. we'll get that one. Um, there's a very interesting question is why um, concerning free speech? Uh, why shouldn't libel be protected? Isn't reputation something that you don't own and is something that other people think of you? That's a very like 
libert libertarian inside baseball uh, question. So, so the person is arguing that why should libel be off limits in terms of freedom? Exactly. Right? Exactly. Okay. Uh, because you can't spread. So you could say Gad Saad is an utter moron who knows nothing in science. Now, I might be upset by that, but that's your opinion. But you can't say, uh, I have proof that Gad Saad eats children as part of his Jewish faith. And I'm right, because there you know that what you're spreading is a lie that could harm my reputation. So you are murdering my reputation. So if people are protected against physical aggression, then surely you aggressing my reputation when you know it to be false can't be something that falls under freedom of speech because then all of us could spread unbelievable lies about one another. You know, Felix, I, I know that Felix is a, is a pedophile and I have proof of that. That's not really a society that you want to live in where there is absolutely no consequences to you spreading falsehoods against people. That's like saying, but why isn't it from a libertarian point of view, okay, if, as you're walking down an alley, if I mug and rape you, that's my right. I mean, no, it's not your right. Well, I mean, they're, they're like certain, certain people also within the libertarian movement who argue that, but like that is, that is something which, uh, you know, is, is, a, is a hot issue, but it's, I guess really? that a lot of people, a lot, no, a lot of people actually agree with that libel should not be protected by freedom of speech, but it's a very, it's, it's a thought, it's more of a thought experiment right? Um, to a certain degree. Um, we're all about the free market of ideas. And the question here is now, isn't boycotting um, or deplatforming a racist person a market mechanism um, of some sort um, to, um, to, you know, in the free market of ideas is boycotting just not a market um, a market response to um, let's say inferior ideas what do you so it, de it depends who's doing it right so mm -hmm. i could quote boycott your ideas by not buying your book right so for example right. there's now a book that's on top of the charts which i warned about this book several years ago people didn't want to listen and now i'm the guy sitting in the back of the room saying i warned you so uh white fragility which is an insane book that's uh, roughly as interesting as Mein Kampf. And I'm not being very hyperbolic. I mean, it's literally a book that is so astonishingly racist against this whole class of people called white people. It's absolutely insane. I'd like to think that in 20 or 30 years, people will look back on this and say, how was it possible that we sort of didn't even bat an eye in allowing this open racism? But it's okay to be racist if it's against white people. Anyways, so I could say the author of White Fragility is a moron, and I'm not going to watch any of her clips. If she comes on television, I won't listen to her. Uh, if she writes a book, I won't purchase it. But you don't have institutional mechanisms that say, let's erase the existence of this person so that she no longer exists. No, she has a right to her stupidity, to her imbecilic ideas, to her racist ideas. I boycott her individually by not partaking in her racism. So I think there is a distinction here. Uh, because when you deplatform people at the institutional level, then one person's racist is another person's realist, right? So yeah. for example, Charles Murray is it, do you know who Charles Murray is? The, the bell curve? The bell curve, right, yeah. exactly. Right. So Charles Murray, uh, according to many people, is basically Himmler, right? He's Mengele, he's, uh, he's Hitler, right? To other people, no, he's a very, very uh, rigorous and serious social scientist who was reporting the data as the data existed. So I think it's very, very dangerous when you have, you know, the morally superior telling us what is appropriate for us to listen to or not listen to. I don't like that. I mean, there is there is this distinction between what what private individuals can do. I mean, nobody really has the right to say, "Hey, Felix, um, you have you have to interview me for my ideas." Right. Um, but you know, when it comes to, for example, public institutions and stuff like that, I think we are um, we're facing a different kind of animal because if for example the if there are is if there's a certain freedom of speech which the which the government ensures um and this is taken from from some people by the government then we face a big problem as well right although i should just mention that i don't like when the freedom of speech discussion is restricted to the government right and, and i mm -hmm. often get people who write to me and say 
but why are you complaining about YouTube demonetizing your videos? Don't you know, professor, that it's not the government? Oh, gee, I didn't know that YouTube was not the government. Thank you for educating me, guy in his basement. But so the, re the reality is that the intrusion to freedom of speech, I mean, yes, we can we can legalize it as oh, it's it's under the purview of the government. But if Google and Facebook and Twitter and YouTube, who have more collective power over us than the entire history of all other entities, because they control all the flow of information, if they decide and they curate what is allowed and what's not allowed, then that is certainly within the, the, the purview of the discussion on freedom of speech. For example, Joe Rogan, as I understand it, decided to ultimately leave, and now he signed a deal with Spotify, for the viewers who don't know, for a very large sum of money, because he was apparently upset that YouTube had warned him that if he were to bring on guests, uh, experts dealing with the coronavirus lockdown, who were saying that maybe it's too draconian, maybe we should open things up, that's not the accepted language, that's not the accepted prescription, and we will take it down, that's dangerous, right? Let those guys come on, and if they're idiots, then they'll lose the... So, so freedom of speech is not something that I think should be restricted to. It's under the government purview or not. Especially because the lines are currently blurring. Um, uh, when, when governments do say, all right, um, we have to curate um, in content on social media, for example, they usually do not do that themselves. In Germany, there's a law basically telling uh, Facebook that if something which is questionable stays up there for a prolonged period of time, they get in trouble, uh, which is so, uh, which is vague enough for them to basically just get, go ahead and, you know, get an algorithm to, to, um, to sort things out and basically restrict free speech in that way. So yeah, the, the lines are definitely blurring. Um, there's a question is, isn't, isn't it a lost cause to attempt to change people's um, hearts and minds who are clearly infested by those false idea pathogens, um, aren't, aren't people like too entrenched in their beliefs? Well, so that, so what that person is basically saying is that it's basically a, a fatal case. There is no way to cure them. Look, there are people who are like that. They are the ones who I said earlier, put there, there's no way for my reason based approach to penetrate their dogma. But I'd like to think that out of 100 people who might be parasitized by these idea pathogens, a certain number, I don't know how many, 10, 20, 50, 80, are at least open to the possibility of being cured of their idea pathogens, or at least hearing the vaccination. Uh, so, Because if not, then we might as well just all uh, wait for the end of time, right? I mean, there, there's no point in us trying to battle these ideas if we truly thought that there is no hope in redressing. Look, did, you, did we know that in the late 1980s, the Soviet empire would collapse as quickly as it did? Uh, could we have known five years earlier that it would collapse so quickly and so cataclysmically? So uh, I'd like to be an optimist and think that even for the most dogged imbeciles, uh, there is a way for reason to penetrate their dark and empty hearts. All right. Um, another question is, how do we fight against people turning political issues into ethical issues? Um, how, how do we deal that? I mean, I also, I also saw you were commenting on the Drew, B, the Drew Brees issue. Oh, um, yes. You know that I mean? was another saga for itself. But yeah. Uh, so I, I, the, the first part is, is tough for me to answer because it seems very vague. So maybe I'll just tackle maybe, the second one. Maybe we can clarify it. Um, this person often runs into political judgments by various people and turning them into moral judgments based on the political subject they talk about. I, so I think there it's a strategy that people use where you want to make the other person, it, it, it's easier to tar the other person if you say that if you hold that position, you're immoral, right? So morality becomes a big cannon that I can use against you. You either believe in gun restrictions, or you are an immoral person who wants to see children being slaughtered in schools. Right. Is that what you're saying? You disgusting Himmler, right? So morality becomes a, 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 a bludgeoning tool that I use. Either you believe in my position or you clearly are an evil person. Uh, and of course, the way you fight against that is that you are armed 
with such good information, as I explained earlier, nomological networks of cumulative evidence, that if you try to come to me with that moral thing, I will drown you in evidence. Now, here's the thing though. I'm, I have great epistemic humility, which means what? When I know something, I walk around with the full assuredness and confidence of someone who knows it. And when I don't know something, I walk with the similar reservation. So if you were to ask me, so what is your position on the legalization of marijuana, professor? I truly don't know enough about this topic. I haven't constructed my nomological network to know, so I won't fake it. I'll say, you know what, Felix, that's a great question. I just, I don't feel like I'm sufficiently armed to properly answer that question. So I think if you navigate life with that level of epistemic humility, then when you do know something, people will trust you and they'll trust you when you say the other thing, right? I walk into my classes and a undergraduate student who's 20 years old will ask me a question. I don't try to fake it. If they got me with that question, I say, you know what, That's a, could you send me the email, remind me of that question? I'm gonna look into it. Well, the fact that I don't pretend that I know everything and the fact that this 20 year old was able to stump me so that I have to go back and check again, that builds trust. It shows that this person is not about spewing bullshit. Uh, so to answer your question, I don't buy this moral stuff. Uh, as a matter of fact, the death penalty, for example, very reasonable people can be for the death penalty and very reasonable people can be against the death penalty. I don't think there is a monopoly from one side or the other in terms of who holds the moral high ground. Do you want me to answer the Drew Brees question? If you want to, I, I heard you're a sports guy. <laughs> I am sport. So Drew Brees, for those of you who don't know, is the all-time leading quarterback in the NFL. A fantastic guy, amazing athlete, and someone who, I don't know him personally, but who from all measures is a family man. He's a religious guy, if you care about that. He's a generous guy. He gives a lot of money. So he's a real great role model. Uh, about a month ago, he basically was on a podcast where he said, uh, well, you know, I can't really support people who denigrate the flag or, or the national anthem and so on. So he was exhibiting patriotism to the United States, right? And people were so aghast, were so disgusted by his patriotism, patriotism that rather than activating his inner honey badger, he capitulated to the EMOB and he issued an apology. When that wasn't enough, he issued a second apology. When that wasn't enough, his wife issued an apology. Now, step back for a second and remember what he's apologizing for. He's apologizing for the fact that he is patriotic to his country. He didn't rape children. He apologized for being patriotic. That, to me, is a coward, right? So this guy can withstand 350-pound linesmen running at him to decapitate his head, you would think he's tough. But the second that the EMOP tells him, you better apologize for loving the United States, and he goes, okay, okay, I apologize. He's not as tough as I thought he was. And that's grotesque. If you want to follow an athlete who doesn't capitulate, who, who is a honey badger, and if you want to stay in football, Herschel Walker is that guy. He just went after the BLM folks, the Black Lives Matter, and he's black, by the way, and he's not backing down. So check him out as a contrapoint to Drew Brees. I mean, I didn't like I didn't agree with his first first statement, but I found it very, um, very interesting and in how he had to apologize and how basically the locker room dynamics basically forced him to do that. It's amazing. Um, so and there's there's another um, right now we like pretty much starting on from from February from from March. There is there's a lot of tension within the, the within the U.S. pretty much um, around um, like following the the, the killing of, of George Floyd. Um, how do you see the the situation right now? And also, do you, are you familiar with what happened to uh, Stephen Pinker? Of course, I'm familiar. Uh, Steve, uh, Steve, Steve is a friend, and we we've communicated uh, privately and and so on. Yeah, of course, I'm familiar. Uh, do you do you want me to summarize what happened to Stephen? Or do yeah, you want me to yeah. Do it? I mean, uh, so as I understand it, uh, there were some, uh, you know, fascists from the cancel culture Taliban who decided that Stephen, uh, you know, had crossed the line uh, in taking certain positions uh, that, frankly, when I looked at the, their examples, they seemed unbelievably tepid and mild. They, they hardly seemed like they were so controversial. Uh, but this is exactly how fascism works. He was talking about data, right? 
was, he was talking was about data, so, data like, right? yeah. so so I don't remember the exact, but so I could be wrong in the examples I'm giving, but right. let's let's give an example. Uh, okay, well, let's look at the number of uh, black uh, individuals versus white individuals that are killed by the police per year. I mean, that's just data, right? I mean, mm -hmm. data can't be racist, right? So let's contextualize. Let's look at whether this is a real problem, whether there is a genocide of you know, black people, right? So he's not trivializing anything. He is just trying to contextualize to modulate the, the size of the problem and so on. Look, the death of one innocent person is tragic enough. So nobody is minimizing. I mean, and right. certainly what happened to George Floyd is, is, is impossible to watch. It's, it's insane. So right. nobody is denying that. But he wanted, being sort of the, the, the clear thinking person that he is, he wanted to, you know, contextualize things. And then these people came after him because it was in unacceptable that he would do such a thing and they wanted to basically have some of his honors from the whatever linguist society and so on some prestigious honors revoked right and what i think upsets me more than maybe the fact that these cancel taliban do this is that you get a whole bunch of professors who then come on board as signatories right because they don't realize that they could be next, right? And it's always the same thing that, you know, you think that if everybody else gets eaten, right, by the crocodile, you'll be the last one. Maybe you could outrun the crocodile or whatever the expression is. But the reality is the, 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 there's an orgiastic self-cannibalization that takes place. When there's no one else to cannibalize, cannibalize you turn on your own. I mean, think about ISIS, right? ISIS, most of the people that they kill are fellow Muslims, right, who aren't Muslim enough. So progressives will turn on other progressives once there aren't any more right-wing extremists to, to cancel. And so I had reached out to Stephen and uh, said to him privately that despite the fact that I gained nothing in defending him publicly, if, if, if anything, I just put myself in view of the canceled Taliban, uh, I was happy to have him come on the show because I've, I've extended that same courtesy to many other professors who have fallen to the uh, cancel mob. Most famously, many of your viewers will know, is Jordan Peterson, who had reached right. out to me back in 2016. I didn't know who he was at the time to come on my show because he, he had fallen prey to you know, the gender pronoun folks and so on. And I've had many, many guests since. Alessandro Strumia, the physicist uh, from uh, CERN, uh, who, who, who was fired from CERN because he presented a paper where he argued that it is not true based on the data that women are you know, grossly discriminated against in physics. It's just the data did not support that position. That was unacceptable. He was a misogynist who was denying the, the existence of women and so on. So uh, yeah, so what Pinker is going through is not good. And if you think they're not gonna come after you, they will. So stand up and speak up. Yeah, and the same, same goes for uh, the, the, the James Damore um, the story at, at Google, um, that was yeah. also something like that. And you talked about, um, you have, you have, like your experience is also in marketing and, um, as from my, how I understood it, emotion is also very important within marketing, you know, basically getting, getting consumers to have a certain, um, like emotional response. So how do you see that, ex that principle extended to the public discourse? How, Yes. powerful are facts actually yes, when, it, when it comes to the when it comes to discourse so in one of my early chapters in the parasitic mind i talk about thinking versus feeling uh precisely because i think it's a false dichotomy it's uh, oftentimes people say use your reason don't succumb to your emotions that's incorrect because we are a feeling animal and we are a thinking animal. Evolution has endowed us with an affective system, affective meaning feelings, and a cognitive system, and a behavioral system, and a perceptual system. So it's not thinking or feeling, it's when do you deploy the right system at the right time? If I'm trying to pass a calculus exam, then triggering my affective system is not going to result in a good outcome. I need to trigger my cognitive system. When I'm walking down a dark alley and I suddenly have a heart palpitation because I see four young men in the alley and therefore my brain says I should probably avoid going in that dark alley, it's my emotional system that kicked in. It's the evolution of my fear-based calculus 
that allowed me to say, you know what, let me take the longer route. Statistically, it's probably not a good idea for me to go down this alley. So it's not that emotions are bad and thinking is good or vice versa. It's making sure that the right system is triggered for the right situation. So if you and I are engaging in a debate of ideas, this is where emotions is bad. Because oftentimes the way that the EMOB works is he who screams louder is the more correct. He who goes into more hysterics is the one who wins the argument. No, in that setting, let's step into the, into the arena. I present my evidence, you present yours and may the best person win. So again, to answer the question, to, to kind of restate it, emotions are important and are, are part of our evolution history. Reasoning is important. Just make sure you trigger it at the right moment. How do you, how do you think we should, like, in the public discourse, one should react if bad motives are attributed to them? For example, if, if we say that um, we have to also look at the data, um, you know, we don't say that the, the, there is no police brutality, especially, like, as soon as really we know and we fight against police brutality every day, right? Um, but, you know, if, if somebody would say, that this makes you um, kind of trivialize or, you know, marginalize um, uh, victims of a, like, you know, of police party from a certain race. How would you, how would you then um, respond to that? So, yeah, so in a sense, what you're asking is a general question of what types of persuasion techniques can you use? And, and, and I actually discussed that in the parasitic mind. It really depends on the situation. So for example, I use, as part of my broad repertoire of persuasion strategies, many different strategies. So for example, satire and sarcasm and ridicule is, I use it in a, in a I'd like to think in a very uh, incisive way because oftentimes satire, as I say, is like the surgeon's scalpel cutting through warm uh, butter. This is why, by the way, totalitarian ideologies, the one of the first things they ban is mockery and satire and humor because it's precisely a very powerful way to defeat bad ideas. So I don't think there is a unique strategy. So to answer your question, there isn't a singular optimal persuasion strategies. Different interventions require different strategies. So for example, when I mentioned earlier, nomological networks of cumulative evidence, that really works well when you're engaged in a big formal debate. You know. How do I prove to you that the hourglass figure is an adaptation? Okay? In other cases, when it's rapid fire on Twitter, this is why I often use, because you're restricted by 180 characters, I can just write a sarcastic analogy that in a few syllables can destroy your position. So I don't think I can answer there is one way to do it, but at least be aware of the full repertoire of weaponry that you could use in attacking someone's position. By the way, I always, even when I'm, I could be really a honey badger, when, when, when someone is, is spewing bullshit and I decide that they are in my radar, for the next two days, I go after this person relentlessly. But I do it always, I think, I hope, never attacking the person, but their ideas. So for example, Bill Nye, do you know who Bill Nye is? The science guy. So the called. science guy, the science guy, right. So Bill Nye, the science guy, who's no longer on my radar, I got tired of him. But at one point, he had gotten on television uh, to argue that uh, what had happened in uh, Paris with the terror attacks, the Bataclan uh, terror attack and so on, he managed to link it to climate change, right? To the one who is holding a hammer, he sees the world made up of only nails, right? So everything for Bill Nye was climate change. And he, he came up with an absolutely hysterical, hallucinatory explanation for how the lack of solar panels and all the other bullshit was related to, the, to, to the, what happened in, in Paris. Well, that upset me so much because, you know, it, of the list of 100 reasons why the Bataclan thing happened, uh, climate change would not make it into the top 100 reasons. So I went after him mercilessly, but I wasn't attacking Bill Nye. I wasn't saying Bill Nye cheats on his wife. I mean, he's not married. I don't attack ad hominem but I do attack you very forcefully for your ideas. So I don't mind if people attack me for my ideas. I think what's, uh, what usually gets me upset is when you uh, violate rules of civility. You see what I'm saying? 
And that's what usually will get me to fight back against you. Because I don't mind if you think I'm a moron and you attack my ideas. I could still think you're wrong, but you know what? That's, I put myself out there. My ideas have to be criticized. But that's why, by the way, I never put photos of my family and so on. Because then I'm opening them up to being abused. Because the mob doesn't care. They'll bring out everybody. But I'm in the public eye. My children and my wife is not. So it's a tough world out there. You have to do what you can. You were talking about um, critiquing ideas. And um, there's a, qu a question in the chat basically saying, uh, how would you answer to those people who state, if communism and socialism or even postmodernism are things which would eventually fail, then why would we want to stop them right now uh, and you know, stop their thinking about it or ponder their pondering about it? Why won't we let them have their own critical try and error method? Well, how many, how many more experiments of socialism and communism do you need before you accept that the experiment has been tried and failed, right? By the way, this is what you should have. This is, and I, by the way, I, I satirize this when someone says Venezuela or whatever. I say, no, 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 but bruh, don't you understand? That's not true socialism. If only we had tried true socialism, right? So the reality is that I don't care about your dumb ideas as long as your dumb ideas don't infringe on the right of a right. single other individual. But if I have to go down the journey of your stupidity and I bear a cost, then we have a problem. Believe in what you want. So for example, religion, believe in whichever booga booga guy that you want to believe in. But if in your belief of booga booga, you infringe one millimeter on my rights, we have a problem. So no, uh, holding views of postmodernism and communism and socialism is not some gentle thing that only affects the portion holding it because the communist or the socialist is trying to impose their utopia on me. We have a problem. So I have to respectfully disagree with the person who asked that question. Yeah. I mean, it's not like stamp collecting, which you do in your basement, it's not right? Stamp, it's not stamp right. collecting. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, there's, a, there's a question about marketing, um, especially about uh, mirror neurons. Uh, what is the role of mirror neurons in marketing consumer behavior? Also, the, what role does the same, do the same neurons play when we witness suffering of people, um, say, on the news in larger communities? And he also connects that in the next question with uh, social justice. The that, suffering. That's a lot. That's a salad of stuff. So it's kind of hard to cover yeah. it. Well, it's very vague. Uh, look, mirror neurons, in a sense, are a, 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 a computational system that allows us to synchronize Uh, each with one another so that we can engage, for example, theory of mind, if some of you have heard of that. Theory of mind is the, is the cognitive ability that we all develop where we, for me to be able to have a valuable conversation with you, I have to put myself in your position to know what you know and so on. So it's a, a, a fundamental part of human sociality. By the way, one group of people who don't have theory of mind, can you, can you guess, Felix, who those people are? Mm, I don't know. They suffer from a, a condition. Can you guess? It starts with the letter A. No, tell me. Autistics. Yep. So, 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 yeah, so one of the ways that you're able to diagnose autism in young children, as I understand it, is there are certain tests that you could give where, given whatever developmental stage they're at, they should already be exhibiting mechanisms of theory of mind. And right. if they don't, that could be a telltale sign of, of autism because they literally can't put themselves in your shoes and so on. And so I think mirror, mirror, mirror that's not my area of, of specialty, but mirror, mirror neurons are part of that, that computational mechanism of uh, regulating with other people and so on. So that's all I can say. How is it used in marketing? Uh, I, I'm not sure that I've ever seen it used in marketing. I mean, the only thing I know about in marketing where these neuro stuff has been used is in what's called neuro, neuro marketing where you basically put people through fMRI machines, functional magnetic resonance imaging machines, so that you can, for example, I want to expose you to fear-based advertising. And I then want to see which part of your brains light up. Does the amygdala light up if you see those ads? It all sounds very fancy and very scientific, but I always warn my students that it suffers here from what I call the illusion of explanatory profundity. It sounds fancy, because you're seeing these multicolored brain imaging images. So it looks sciencey. And so there are all these consulting firms that will charge you huge amounts of money to better understand the consumer through the neuroimaging. The reality is 
you can't predict shit. And most of it is an utter scam. Not, not in terms of neuro, the field, but in terms of using neuro knowledge for better strategic marketing, I think there's still a big bridge to be filled. All right. I'm looking at the questions. Hold on. There's another one coming in. Um, the, looking at the questions, we're, we're reaching the end. Um, and it, I had, it I had, by. I had, I had a great fun actually. Um, so your, your, when is your book coming out and how do we, how do we, you know, explore your ideas more if we want to? Uh, so the book is coming out, uh, October 6th. So yesterday would be three months from now. So October 6th, it'll be out. It'll be available on Kindle if you prefer it that way as a physical book and also on audible. So different ways that you can get it. Uh, it's available in all sorts of platforms. I think it is now available on Amazon uh, Germany for your German viewers, but it's also available on Amazon UK, Amazon CA, Amazon.com. So it should be available everywhere. If you want to know more about my work, uh, I, I appear on many shows, as you said, Felix, but I also have my own YouTube channel where I do all sorts of things. I also started a podcast recently Uh, so that I can now upload all of my YouTube content on, on the podcast because a lot of people don't like to be streaming on YouTube. They'd rather just download it and listen to it. And so about a month ago, I started a podcast and it's going really well. Uh, the, the YouTube channel is The Sad Truth, S-A-A-D. Uh, the, the, the podcast is The Sad Truth with Dr. Sad. Uh, you could follow me on Twitter, on Facebook, all the usual places. I'm everywhere. I haunt your dreams. Are you more active in social media due to quarantine? Uh, I, I am very active. And my wife keeps telling me that if I want to reduce my blood pressure, I need to be less active. So I try once in a while to institute certain rules. I try not to get on social media on the weekends. I usually fail. But uh, I think for my mental sanity, I need to return to those strict rules of engagement because it's, it could really suck you into a vortex of negativity. All right, one last, one last question. Yeah. What would be your advice to young people um, fighting for liberty? Um, what can we do uh, to, to better cope with the challenges? What can we do to actually uh, channel our inner honey badger? <laughs> so I would say, look, I understand that for some people, there are real pragmatic issues. If, 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 you, if you know that you're going to lose your job and you have three children and if you speak out, you might lose it and they can't. I get that. So I'm not saying just become a reckless martyr. But when I say activate your inner honey badger, it means that everybody can decide what is the limit of their engagement, but at least know that you should be engaged. Your engagement might be you only share my videos. So then don't say, oh, no, no, no. But if I share Gatsad's videos, I'm going to offend some of my friends. Then you're not a honey badger. You're a coward, right? So I'm not saying that everybody needs to start a YouTube channel and get 10 million followers and scream from top. But all I'm saying is find whatever you're comfortable with. And then within the, those limits, know that your voice matters. It might only be on Facebook with your friends, your close group. It might be only at the pub with your friend. But just don't be completely silent and apathetic. So in that sense, activate your inner honey badger, speak out get engaged, don't subcontract this fight to only a few people who are bearing most of the costs, be involved. All right, thank you very much. Those are beautiful closing words. And um, we, thank all, we thank you first, but also all of our um, viewers. Um, without you, this wouldn't be possible. Um, make sure to um, you know, follow us. Also, we have a lot of videos um, you know, on different topics concerning, concerning liberty. And uh, yeah, we will upload them um, throughout July as well. Um, there will be new uploads and uh, yeah, make sure to follow us and on Thank social you. media. If, if everybody were as engaged as you guys, maybe we wouldn't have the problems we have in university. So thank you for your work. Thank you.